Okay, hello and welcome to the Open Education Network's Pub 101. Thank you for joining us for today's session. My name is Melissa Chim and I'm the Scholarly Communications Librarian for Excelsior University. And I'll be your host and facilitator for today. Um, as everyone kind of trickles in and we get started, um, I'm starting to think about my trip to Minnesota next week for the Library Publishing Coalition Conference. And I thought I would open up to everybody in the chat. Go ahead, introduce yourself, and maybe talk about any travel plans that you have coming up. OK, soon I will be handing it off to Karen Bjork and Abby Childs from the Virginia Commonwealth University Libraries to talk about call for proposals. As always, we will leave time for your questions and conversation at the end. There may be many of you who have experience with this topic in addition to our guests, and we invite you to share your experiences and resources. Oh, and Amanda is coming to LPF as well. And oh, Elizabeth um, is from Florida, and she gets to travel to North Carolina this weekend. Oh, and it's for fun, not for a conference. That's always good to hear. Oh, there's actually quite a lot of people going to the Library Publishing Forum this weekend. So that is exciting. So I can't wait to see everybody there. Um, as we get started here, just a few housekeeping details. We have an orientation document that includes our schedule and links to session slides and recordings. If you can't make it to a session and want to know what you missed, please check the document and all of this will be available in the chat in the next couple mi minutes. Uh, please remember there is a companion resource for these sessions, the Pub 101 Canvas Curriculum, and that's where you'll find the resources and templates um, I just mentioned. We are recording the session and we'll add it to our YouTube Pub 101 Spring 2024 playlist that will be also available on our link tree. Uh, we are committed to providing a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for everyone aligned with our community norms. And please join us in creating a safe and constructive space. Finally, all links to the resources just mentioned can be found in one place. That will be our link tree, which will be in the chat momentarily. And now I'll hand things over to Karen Bjork and Abby Childs to talk about call for proposals. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Let me just go ahead and share my screen and get into presentation mode. And then we will get started. Okay, everyone can see presentation. All good to go. Perfect. Thank you, Karen. Uh, so Abby and I are going to be talking about community, uh, communicating capacity and expectations using uh, your call for proposal. So I'm going to start by introducing ourselves. My name is Karen Bjork. I am head of digital libraries and publishing here at VCU Libraries. So prior to working at VCU Libraries, I oversaw the open textbook publishing program PDX Open at Portland State University. So many of my experiences that I'm going to be talking about within this presentation um, come from my time at PSU. And I'm Abby Childs. I'm the Open Educational Resources Librarian at VCU. Um, my background primarily has been in public services, and I'm still pretty new to my role um, at, as the OER Librarian at VCU, um, as well as to OER Publishing. So since Karen and I are both relatively new to our roles at VCU, we've been able to take advantage of the sort of unique opportunity um, as we've been kind of coming in and getting a sense of the program. and um, starting to make you know, tweaks here and there to kind of review our, our program with fresh eyes. Um, and we'll talk more about um, sort of the impact that that's had on our call for proposals this year. So I always like to uh, provide what we're gonna cover before we dig into the presentation. Um, so we'll cover an overview of what to include in your call for proposals. We'll talk about services and support um, look at what a final product and timeline can look at. We'll discuss author challenges and the most important lessons learned that you can take away, improve, and then continue to run uh, call for proposals year after year. So before we get started, um, so while you heard from Carla about MOUs last week, the call for proposal actually comes first. And it does actually inform your author agreement or your MOUs. Um, so the two should really mirror each other in terms of author and program requirements. So the call for proposals or CFP, it really provides your program the opportunity to set priorities, expectations, and your program's capacity. So it is your dating profile. 
Um, it typically, it's typically how faculty first hear about your initiative. So it really provides that opportunity to communicate and define the program's priorities, expectations, level of funding, and capacity. And it also assists with setting author expectations. It allows the authors to have an idea of what they're getting into before they actually get into it. And this is really important because many of our authors are gonna be working on their OERs during the academic year. And so we really need to, they really need to know like how much time and effort are they gonna get funding to be able to allow them to maybe you know, potentially not teach for the year, or are they going to have to teach at the same time while creating? So these, you want to be able to have these questions answered before they apply for the proposal. It's really important um, in order to ensure that uh, their, their project is successful in the end. Um, and Abby and I will actually be spending the majority of our presentation talking about questions that you should ask and providing examples from our own initiatives. Um, so there's many open textbook OER publishing call for proposals out there. And so I always recommend looking at what others have done. Um, and so this is what I did when I first got started. And I continue to look at how other schools approach their call for proposals. There really is no reason to reinvent the wheel. There are so many programs out there. And really, it's fantastic because you can sort of pick and choose which you think are going to best apply to your program. And it's always important to revise your call for proposal each round. So priorities shift, um, lessons are learned, budgets are always different, and there's always something that you missed within your call for proposal for the previous year. And Abby will definitely talk about um, some of those examples as, as, as we get and move forward. All right, so as I mentioned in the previous slide, so before you release your call for proposal, you'll want to consider and decide the focus of your grant program, and this is really important. You'll need to ask yourself, who will, be, who will you be encouraging to apply, and does your program have a specific focus? So for example, will you be encouraging faculty who teach first-year courses? Is your focus on high enrollment? Will your program focus on a particular discipline or area? Are you looking to work with a department or a degree program rather than a single course? Is the focus of your OER program to support diversity, equity, and inclusion? So several years ago, when I worked at Portland State University, we wanted to target high enrollment courses. So we designed our call for proposal around that goal. So one of the things that we needed to do was define what it meant by high enrollment. So this took us a bit of time to work out because PSU didn't have a definition for high enrollment courses. Um, so it meant we had to consult with the registrar's office and other institutional partners. Um, and then we ended up sort of essentially getting a consensus that high enrollment was defined as courses that had approximately 500 students annually. And so while it took us a while to land on this number, it was definitely worth it in the end because then we knew which courses to target our marketing for our call for proposals towards. And when we were having conversations with faculty that were interested, one of the first questions we asked them is, how many students on average do you have per year? And we were able to tell them, you know, while you're welcome to apply, if we have too many applications than what we have funding for, your proposal will not be a priority. So our most recent call for proposal at uh, VCU requires that each project and proposal demonstrate an intention to equity, diversity, and inclusion. And we note within our call for proposal how it'll, um, so we note sort of how how within our call for proposal to differentiate and how the faculty should write about how they're going to incorporate DEI into it. Um, so for example, we, are, we asked uh, folks to um, look at creating content that fills representational gaps in existing course resources, ensuring resource images, examples, and case studies that represent a wide variety of identities and lived experiences, and then also um, having them solicit feedback from the diverse pool of reviewers. So within the proposals, all of the faculty needed to address, or they, they need to address, how they're going to uh, focus their projects on DEI. 
And we found this to be uh, really important to have these priorities explicitly stated because again, we um, ended up having you know, we end up having more proposals than we can fund. And so we do want to say, here's our requirements, here's the rubric that we used, and this is the reason why we chose these particular ones. So it's really an important exercise to really first figure out where your priorities lie. Sorry, I just lost my uh, train of thought. Okay, so... Um, when we talk about priorities, we're going to shift now to requirements. So it's what are the requirements of your program? So in my experience, your requirements tend to be more specific with each round. And I can tell you our call for proposals every year are getting longer and longer. It's actually becoming um, somewhat of a problem. And we have to look and be like, OK, is this really do we really need to include this information? And nine times out of 10, it is. And it's just the nature of, you know, of our of our program. And so because we want to be really specific, we end up having quite a long, uh, long final call for proposal. But it is, you know, so some of the questions that you're going to ask yourself is, you know, what CC license um, will you require your authors to use? Um, you know, will you be asking and requiring that projects meet accessibility standards, such as um, making sure that audio and video materials include closed captioning? Will you require one-on-one -on -one check ins uh, monthly group meetings and workshops? How will grantees share their successes or talk about their challenges? And this is also important for building community and ensuring that projects are completed on time. So at VCU, for example, grantees must participate in a summer cohort kickoff meeting as um, they must also have one-on-one -on -one check ins um, They have bi-monthly group meeting, cohort meetings. And um, so these, so the kickoff meeting that we have right at the beginning of the program, it actually provides grantees with the opportunity to meet each other and learn about um, publishing, copyright, accessibility, open pedagogy. And for us, the focus really is on that building a community of practice and learning and having the cohort get together and get to know each other and become comfortable with asking each other questions. Um, many of the faculty members have never met each other before, and now we're asking them to, to participate in this large project. So we really want them to become comfortable with each other, to get to know each other, and really be able to lean on each other because, you know, what they're partaking and participating in can feel sometimes very overwhelming. And if they know that there's a group of faculty that are along for the ride with them, it allows them to really be able to sort of lean on not only um, our project manager, Abby, but also each other and be able to sort of ask questions of one another and feel and see how people are are dealing with sort of the requirements of, of teaching as well as, you know, trying to create this new content. Um, and so we have seen that the success of our program, a lot of it lies within that community building. And it's a really important aspect. And we're actually looking at ways in order to enhance that. You also want to see what um, the uh, peer review, are you going to require your books to be reviewed? Is it going to be open peer review, blind peer review? Um, and what are the project deadlines? Are you going to have a set deadline or are you going to have an estimated deadline? And the reason I say that is because what we have found within project deadlines in particular is that, you know, those change. Uh, we typically are asking fa faculty to be able to create this material during the academic year. And so because of that, you know, th the priorities shift and change. And so we really do need to be flexible. But we also want these projects to end at some point. They just cannot continuously continue. So it's really about really making clear deadlines, trying to find ways to hold faculty accountable and sort of saying to faculty, OK, what do you think your deadline would be and how can we get there? So award levels and funding. Um, so this is one area that I think is constantly changing. Um, in particular, for each of our calls for proposals, we always look at how much money do we actually have to offer, um, as well as what kind of projects do we want to support. 
Um, and so what, you know, so the questions are, will you do mini grants and, or will you only, you know, so will you do mini grants and only support adopt and adapt grants? Would you focus just on creation? Um, would you want to focus on early stage projects or provide funding for projects that have already been published, but need additional support to be updated? Um, so your overall budget will help determine this answer. So when my program had limited funding, um, I designed a call for proposal around adapting and adopting projects only. So even with that limited funding, it provided the opportunity to continue to support faculty who are flipping their course. Um, it just unfortunately meant that we couldn't, we didn't have the capacity to support faculty that wanted to create a whole new textbook. Um, at VCU, we recently transitioned to having faculty tell us how much money they need to complete their projects. So instead of setting it at a certain amount, for example, fifteen hundred if you wanted to adapt, two thousand if you wanted to to adopt and 5,000 if you wanted to create, we say to faculty, tell us how much it's going to cost. We may not be able to fund it at that full level, but we wanna be able to have faculty say to us, this is, you know, this is how much I believe it's gonna cost me. And it also leads to some very good questions about their projects and making sure that they have a full understanding of what it means to, to run that full project. Um, and Abby will actually be talking about uh, what funding, so Abby will actually be talking about um, the the lessons learned with uh, this various funding level as well. Um, and so it's just an interesting way that we've decided to approach this. All right, budget. Um, so there is, there's a lot to say about the budget. And I actually feel that this is one of the most complicated areas. And unfortunately, I it when I first started doing uh, running my OER program, it totally caught me off guard. I was not expecting the amount of time that it was taking uh, for me to be able to manage budgets. And part of that was because my uh, university, Portland State, we in the library actually distributed the funds ourselves. So that is one of the big questions that you do need to figure out before you even get started with your program is who will be taking care of the distribution of the funds? Is it going to be your library's fiscal office or are the funds going to get directly deposited to the faculty members department? That in itself totally changes the way in which you will handle your call for proposals and your requirements. So as I noted at PSU library, we distributed the funds to authors directly. Um, so this required regular meetings with the library's budget analyst to ensure that we were on track and we stayed on budget. Um, we had to set up spreadsheets and documents that guided every decision that we made. So if your institution distributes the funds directly, here are some things that you'll need to think about. Will the funds be distributed as one lump sum? Uh, will it be in the beginning, the mid, or the end of the project? Or is it a combination of, um, of those? Will the authors need to meet certain expectations and deadlines to receive payment? Or will you be offering a, you know, will you be offering a departmental buyout? Uh, who will cover other payroll expenses known as OPE? So those are employer paid taxes such as Social Security and Medicaid and Medicare. And if you're offering a stipend of $2,500, for example, will the faculty re receive the gross wages of $2,500? Or will they actually only receive $2,000 after taxes and OPE are taken out? How will this affect your overall budget? Will your institution hire and handle contracts? Uh, if so, who will do that work? Have you spoken to your university's HR to ensure that you are not violating any contracts or HR law? Uh, this was something that we had to work really hard on at Portland State, particularly with hiring faculty. Um, those that we had some that were 12 month contracts, some were 10 month contract. So we needed to ensure that we were not violating any HR laws or regulations. So if you deposit, if you provide your budget straight to the department, it sounds like it's a lot easier, um, but in fact, there are still things in which you need to consider and think about, and it's it's tricky just in its own unique way. 
Um, so at VCU, as I had noted, we give them to um, our department. We give it to the faculty's uh, department at the beginning of the, fa of the fiscal year. Um, but one of the things that we are now requiring all of our faculty to figure out, even before they apply, is what will their department allow them to do with the money and how long do they have to spend the money out? Um, it is something in which, uh, unfortunately, we've come across issues on. Um, and so now we're, we're learning lessons about how to handle all of that. And again, Abby will talk more about this during our lessons learned. And my last slide before we transition to Abby is services and support. So you must clearly define what services your program will offer. So here are a few questions that I recommend answering to help you decide on what your services, your program has the capacity to support. So will your open textbook authors just write their book or will they also be responsible for editing and designing it? Will the authors be responsible for clearing copyright or will your program provide assistance with this? So at Portland State, many of our open textbooks that we supported were language education books and they required international copyright clearance. So while we worked closely with the author to draft the copyright clearance permission letters, we required the authors to request the permissions themselves. And a lot of that was just because many of the authors had connections based in the countries in which they were teaching the language of. So for example, we had a Russian textbook and she was using literature from the 1920s in Russia and her parents had lived in, in, the, in Russia and so were able to actually help her navigate what the Russian copyright law was saying. So there was no way that I could have provided that level of support or information, but I was, I was happy to try to help in any which way possible. So the other thing you'll want to ask is during the author's creation process, will the library assist with pedagogical questions or does your university have instructional designers that you can refer them to? Do you have any in-house expertise? Is there staff in your library or at your university that can do copy editing or design? Does that person have the capacity to take on the work? Would you charge for these services? So if the library already offers publishing and or hosting services, can this initiative be affiliated with those services? So at VCU's OER initiative, it's based in digital libraries and publishing. So our OER publishing services align with our journal, monograph, and repository publishing. So we uh, offer ISBN or DOI assignment. We do author rights and right re revisions, digital preservation, editorial services. Um, we do multi multiple formats and dissemination, and we are uh, we will come this summer be able to offer pr a pressbook publishing platform as well. And if you don't have that in-house expertise, will authors be responsible for finding editors and designers themselves? Or will this be something that your program will handle? How will you handle peer review? As I said in the previous slide, you know, will your books be double blind or open peer review? Will your program pay peer reviewers or will authors need to pay um, for those reviewers? If so, how many peer reviewers will be affiliated with your institution? Do you have criteria for who the peer reviewers can or cannot be? Um, will the authors be required to set aside a certain amount of funding to be designated for editorial and production services? So this is something that I had done at PSU, and I learned that the length of the book will impact the over overall cost of editorial and production services. It sounds so uh, straightforward, but I was very surprised at the cost differential differentiation um, between books that are 100 pages versus those that are 150. Um, and so that was a really tricky process to figure out how much money we wanted authors to set aside. Um, the other thing is authors don't typically think about production services right at the very beginning, and it isn't till the end of their projects that all of a sudden they are looking to find money to support and they may have already gotten through um, their funding and now they're trying to struggle with how can I get a good copy editor when I don't have a lot of money left over. And so that was why we um, thought it was really important to have and to say, okay, you must look at setting aside X number of dollars, but we recommend a higher level. Um, and so 
with that, I am going to pass it on to Abby to talk about final production and timeline. Awesome. Thanks, Karen. Um, so yeah, kind of looking into um, the, the final product as you've gotten through the creation process with your authors. Um, important to think about licensing. Um, certainly, will the author retain their copyright or does the copyright go to the university? Um, the, the anecdote from, from PSU um, was, you know, when they originally started the program, the author had to give their copyright over to the university, but they were able to um, negotiate and work with the university council to allow the authors to keep and retain their copyright. So it's really important to check with your legal counsel um, before releasing your call for proposal to make sure that, you know, you're clear with authors and, and you're clear yourself um, sort of what the author rights are as they relate to these projects. Um, you'll also need to adjust what Creative Commons licenses the textbooks will be published under, which Karen mentioned a little bit um, earlier. So there's some wiggle room or some choices to be made about whether you allow authors to choose a CC license from sort of any of, of the options or if you're going to require them to publish under a particular license or limit. Um, for example, um, a lot of CFPs will limit like you, you can choose your CC license, but um, you can't use no derivatives so that, you know, your work can be remixed and adapted. Um, so definitely a lot of decisions to be made there as well. Um, and then also, what does a completed textbook look like? Um, do you want to define the length of the, the, the resource or the number of chapters or sections? Um, do you want to assign a structure or style? Um, do you want to require certain elements like a table of contents or, um, you know, other sort of front and back matter pieces um, to have a cohesive look and feel to the products that are coming out of your program. And then you'll also kind of want to think about what, what constitutes the final product. So as Karen mentioned earlier, you know, these projects can't go on forever um, as much as we would love to have limitless bandwidth and capacity to support. Um, and we know, of course, that, that OER work requires the sort of sustainability considerations and, and revision. So it's kind of about priming your authors to think about that upfront, about you know, when when do we call your project um, closed for the purposes of, of this program with the understanding, right, that this is going to be a living resource that as it gets used, it's going to need to be updated and um, you should have a plan for long term sustainability and revision. Um, so that's that's been kind of a conversation that we're starting to navigate with some of our um, projects from the 2023 cohort who are getting closer to, um, you know, having a finished product is like, okay, what is, what does the closeout process look like? When, when are you ready to sort of leave the nest? Um, and, you know, how can we free up also sort of our internal bandwidth to turn our attention to, um, to new projects and the new cycle as well. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so yeah, and then also kind of thinking about what are the potential challenges um, for the various phases. So um, during the application process, we ask authors to think about what are potential barriers or roadblocks that you see sort of looking ahead at your project plan um, that you might encounter as you sort of create and develop your project. Um, this is an important exercise, uh, especially when looking at sort of realistic timelines, service expectations. Um, and also potential knowledge gaps. Um, so sort of acknowledging that, you know, in, in your OER program or also like on the faculty side, there may be areas that aren't um, necessarily covered by, um, for example, the service model. So Karen mentioned um, sort of instructional design support at VCU, our instructional design framework is pretty dispersed across campus. And there are some departments that don't have um, a sort of designated instructional designer for their area. Um, and that's not something that we have capacity within the library to do. So there are some places where there may be gaps in sort of coverage of service. And so that's something to think about too, is um, where might there be additional support needed and where might there be um, a need to sort of modify the project plan um, to, to account for um, those limitations. So um, other potential challenges could include licensing questions, um, staffing challenges, like I mentioned, skills gaps, content availability, um, time concerns, et cetera. Um, Certainly the list goes on and I feel like this is one of those things that Karen mentioned that the, the list grows every year because we find out about, um, you know, new, new challenges and, and each project is different. And so it's, it's helpful to kind of think through these on a, on a case by case basis. And this is also another place where those one on one meetings with faculty are really helpful um, to kind of identify those challenges as they come up throughout the, the course of the project so that we can look at ways to kind of mitigate them. And then um, thinking about our selection. Uh, criteria for how we evaluate our applications. Um, so we have a couple of criteria areas. Um, 
based on our specific evaluation criteria, which are listed in full on the call for proposals. Um, but those are the project objectives, impact, plan for timeline, equity and inclusion, and feasibility. Um, so I have an excerpt here from the rubric, which shows the criteria, and then the sort of what that looks like at different scores. Um, and we solicited feedback from um, liaison librarians for the disciplines for which the projects um, had applied and got their feedback sort of with their subject matter expertise in mind. Um, so thinking about, um, again, those program priorities that Karen mentioned earlier, um, this was an area where we added in a section about equity and inclusion to make sure that that criteria had showed up on the rubric and that we were sort of not only asking for faculty applicants to think about that, but also um, sort of weighing that as part of our um, evaluation process. And lessons learned. Um, so lots to talk about here. Um, the first section is just kind of about the project management perspective. Um, supporting projects takes a lot of time. Um, so I think that probably came through in my comments about, you know, being able to free up bandwidth to support new projects. Um, I think it never hurts to, to mention that, you know, bandwidth and, and time and staffing are all limited um, wherever you are. So it's, it's really helpful to be cognizant of the number of projects that you have the capacity to fully support, um, you know, based on your role and your position and your staffing. Um, timelines and priorities shift. So it's helpful to work with authors at the beginning of their project to think about competing priorities. Um, so not only your own priorities within the library, but also, you know, faculty members are, are juggling their own set of competing priorities, which are gonna impact their timelines. And so it's helpful, again, to have those one-on-one check-ins and conversations and to be flexible if, if changes need to happen. Um, policies and procedures um, for um, no longer supporting projects. This is um, a sad fact, but a, re a realistic one. Um, we don't want to stop supporting projects, but sometimes you need to if the author is you know, not available to keep working um, or sort of not meeting program requirements or expectations. So um, it's a good question to ask sort of upfront before you have um, you know, a challenging situation, like what procedures you have in place to potentially pause their participation in the project um, and what steps will you need to follow, who needs to be notified. Um, and then similarly, if an author leaves the institution mid-project, what happens? Do you continue to support the project? Um, and a lot of times that's gonna come down to a case-by-case -case basis where, um, you know, for example, if they're going to an institution that doesn't have an OER publishing platform, you might consider um, continuing to host their project on your own press books or something like that. Um, so those are conversations that then can kind of happen um, as situations arise, but it's really helpful to think about them upfront to kind of have a plan in place so you're not scrambling um, in the heat of the moment to figure out, you know, what's the best course of action. Oh, sorry, I, I missed a bullet point. Can you, yeah, thank you. Um, and then the last piece there is just to be really clear about your budget um, distribution. Carrie mentioned this, um, when talking about the sort of setup for funding. Um, but I think one of our big lessons learned from the last cycle was to make sure, um, as she mentioned, that we're sort of aware and that faculty are aware of the, the various policies that sort of impact the usage of the budget. Um, so I think you probably can't, can't possibly get enough clarity about the budget. Um, I ask a lot of questions, talk to the folks who are managing it both internally in the library and also if you're, if you're going the route where you're distributing to um, <clears throat> each individual department to make sure that you're um, sort of aware of those policies and definitely bringing faculty into the process to make sure that they're also aware so that, for example, if, um, which we learned is a very common thing that faculty or that um, funding has to be spent within a single fiscal year that faculty are aware of that and that they don't have, you know, a budget plan that has them spending their allotment into the, the second fiscal year, for example. Um, so that's, that's a really big um, important piece just to make sure you've got clarity about how that all works. Um, also specificity. Um, it's great to provide opportunities for feedback and suggestions, both from your team and from applicants throughout your program's run. Um, so this is a really good learning opportunity. Um, mistakes happen, and especially when you're dealing with project management with a lot of different people with competing priorities and very busy schedules. Um, things are going to come up, and so it's really helpful to have those avenues for feedback um, so that, you know, you can learn where you might be able to better support faculty in the future um, and also make changes and tweaks to your program to help it kind of fit into the flow of the academic cycle over the course of the year, for example. Um, it also, you know, continues to support faculty innovation um, and, and save students money, ultimately. Um, 
thinking about specificity as well with the call for proposals, it's helpful to set clear selection eligibility and rubric, um, which the trade-off is there. You've got a long, <laughs> long call for proposal, but um, that specificity helps in the long run uh, because you're kind of giving everybody the information up front um, so that they can decide whether it's the right fit for them at this time and also what they need to include and sort of be prepared for um, throughout the project process. And then lastly, it's okay to reject proposals. Um, you wanna make sure that you've got strong, well thought out proposals um, and that what you're publishing is a representation of your program. Um, so you wanna ensure that it meets the, the spirit of your project and what you're trying to do. Um, re re rejecting proposals also provides an opportunity to have a conversation with faculty who are interested in OER, um, even if it's not the right project or the right time um, or the plan needs to be tweaked, but it provides an opportunity to work with them to move their proposal forward for the future. Um, and can be a way to expand those connections across campus. So it's a good way to kind of increase opportunity or increase awareness um, of OER work across campus more broadly and to start having those conversations like Karen mentioned, it's sort of community of practice aspect that, you know, even if you have faculty that aren't necessarily working formally in your program, you can still make those connections and have those conversations and that you can sort of be building to um, those broader connections and broader community of practice over time. So yeah, opportunity to create awareness on campus. Um, yeah, like Karen said, it's, it's sort of your, your dating profile. Um, why should faculty be interested? Why should they participate? Why should they care? Um, what are the benefits? So asking them to think about sort of impact, including but not limited to cost savings. Um, we've had a lot of folks who participated in the program who have told us they've started to think more broadly about pedagogy, which is like really exciting. I mean, that's, that's sort of um, not, not the only point, but like a point of this work is that you've got people sort of reevaluating and, and innovating with how they teach and interact with students. Um, what expertise as a program manager do you bring to the program and how can you sort of advocate for the library services um, through this program? And then also opportunities for campus partnerships. So um, we mentioned instructional designers and um, liaison librarians, like who else can you bring into the fold um, to sort of help facilitate this work on your campus? And I think that's it, yep, okay, so great. Um, so yeah, questions are more than welcome. And then we've got Karen and I's emails there. Um, if you wanna reach out, we'd be happy to chat as well. Thank you both so much. This has been really informative. I know with me, we're kind of at the point where we're starting our publishing platform from scratch. So to hear all these things to keep in mind is actually really helpful. Um, so. Now we could kind of transition over to Q&A. Please feel free to put your questions in the chat or if you would like to unmute and say a question out loud, please feel free to. Um, also, I am going to put a, another link to the Padlet. Uh, Padlet's very easy to use. Uh, just scroll down to session five, um, May 8th, call for proposals and you'll see a little plus sign and there you can um, add any of your thoughts into these little sticky notes. And you even have the option of changing the color too. So a little extra fun. So let me put that in the chat and I'll open it up to everybody. Um, Amanda put in a really good point actually in the chat. Um, she wrote, uh, for example, for our syllabus review grants, which is a curation slash adoption grant, we require that they agree to meet with the library liaison three times reduce their course materials costs by 25% and participate in, in a survey afterwards. So you could set publishing requirements based on how you want to scope your program. Oh, and actually there's a question from Karen in uh, the chat. Um, uh, this one is actually for Karen from Karen. Uh, you mentioned that asking faculty authors to estimate their costs led to good conversations and questions. Can you say more about that? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I think most or maybe all OER publishing uh, programs sort of really struggle with is the idea that the amount of labor that it takes to create the book is never going to be anywhere near the amount of funding that we can offer. And so we wanted to be able to, you know, have a very frank and open discussion with faculty about what it could potentially look like and take um, in order to create their, their OER in the end. And really a lot of it is looking at who are their partners, who are their co-authors? Could they expand out the number of co-authors in order to sort of lessen the amount of work that they do? But then how do you 
essentially provide funding or incentive for those co-authors co to be able to participate. So that's been one sort of aspect of, of this um, conversation and having faculty estimate the cost on their own. Because it's really like we're, we're trying to essentially remind authors that you know it's a lot of it's a lot of work um, to be able to to create this level of material and in particular like a lot of the timelines are pretty short like some you know we're looking at you know essentially two years or two academic cycles which if you're teaching at the same time like that really is not a lot of time to be able to do the amount of work that is required. The other part of this as well is to have them really think about what it means. It's it's in align with the first part, what it means to create an OER um, and what kind of services do they need? So when we can actually see what their budget looks like, we can talk as a group and say, oh, it doesn't look like they've designated anything for copy editing or for designers. And so it's also about having, the, having that conversation. Because one of the things we do is, you know, we open it up. So Abby this year had a um, an open call. So essentially, she had a Zoom link. Uh, she talked about the program, and then it and then asked faculty to you know do a Q and A. And then uh, some faculty reached out and said, "Oh, I'd like to talk to you more." So uh, Abby spent the time, spoke to them, got a clear understanding of their projects, made recommendations, and then they went and they put in their proposals. And now we're in the the process of accepting the proposals and having those one-on-one -on -one conversations even further to kind of discuss the projects and talk to them about, you know, how much we were able to fund them, what it looks like, and maybe pieces of what their budget was missing. So it provides Abby, and I'm speaking for Abby, so I'm going to uh, be quiet here shortly, um, but it provides Abby with a really good understanding of the projects. It allows the faculty to get to know Abby, and it's creating a relationship even before the projects officially kick off. So I'm going to pivot and ask Abby to expand on that. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think you covered a lot of the, the sort of big points that I would have brought up. I think I'll add just, just two pieces. The first is that like sometimes faculty don't know what they don't know. So for example, we had somebody budget for, um, for licensing fees for streaming movies and we're like, well, we have a collections budget. So that's great. So we don't need to like, like you don't have to worry about funding that piece of it with this program. Um, and then I think the other piece, which is Karen sort of, um, touched on a little bit is, is this idea of like differentiating that like this program is not intended to be compensation for the labor because like we would never have the budget to be sufficient to do that in a real way um and I was really grateful actually in that the Q&A session I got some very direct questions about that of like you know based on what you're saying like typical project of applicants like this isn't enough to compensate the labor of like writing a textbook and it's nice to be able to kind of acknowledge that explicitly and to sort of I guess maybe helpfully, maybe maybe not, although like the faculty that I spoke with seemed receptive to sort of reframe that as like, you're totally right, like this isn't going to be enough to compensate you for the work, but like we're seeing this as like, what what do we, what can we give you to like get you started? Like what do you need to make this happen if it's a thing that you want to do? Um, so I think that reframe has been kind of helpful um, and it's not going to convince everyone, right? Like everybody has, kind of has their own reason for coming into this work. And I think because it's it's such an enormous commitment for faculty authors, um, I want to respect that. And I don't want to like pretend that, you know, a $2,000 stipend is enough to like cover the creation of a textbook. It's, it's just not. Um, but I think being clear with like what we're offering of like what, what amount can we give you that you would need to kind of get you over the hump to, you know, cover your travel costs for, um, you know, conducting video interviews, which is like one of our projects in the past, or, um, you know, covering a copy editor or something like that. Like, I think that we're sort of, it's, it's a facilitation money <laughs> rather than a compensation money, if that, if that helps. We've also, um, have really, uh, it, we've also increased how much level of support and education we're offering throughout our cohort cycle. So while we may not be able to financially compensate folks, we are trying to increase our level of, of services so that they, you know, sort of that in kind. And so faculty feel much more supported and it's not just like, oh, here's the money now go off and we'll see you in six months. Like we really are trying to, you know, 
provide a high level of service in order to uh, sort of, you know, be like, sorry, we can't, we can only offer you a thousand dollars, you know, so we're trying to kind of balance that out. It looks oh, like there's, have, uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, I was just going to say, we actually, um, to jump off from that too, we actually have another um, two-part question about funding. I know it's a really big topic, especially with uh, publishing. So Janelle asks, uh, my faculty are asking for funding to revise OER projects. I'm curious if you support that specifically in your program and how much you, money you award for that. Also, do you fund both individual and group projects? Yeah, I can jump in on this one. Um, so uh, the first question, do we support um, revision projects? Yes. Um, so we had kind of a fun one where like the initial resource was created under one of our first cycles of the ACA program. And then um, another faculty member took the course over and then applied um, a couple years later to do a second edition of the course. Um, so that was one example. Um, I think there have been other revision projects as well. Um, but um, again, as Karen mentioned, our sort of funding model has shifted over the years. I think that was maybe under a different framework that we had set up. But um, if we were to get other revision applications, it would be the same sort of like, you tell us what you need to make this happen. Um, and we'll, we'll see if hopefully we can make that happen for you. Um, and then the question about individual and group projects, yes. Um, so I think the first big like departmental project that we had was in our 2023 cycle. Um, so that was part of the departure from that old funding framework that Karen had talked about, where I think it was, you know, $1,000 to adopt, 2000 to adapt, and 5000 to create. Um, but for this departmental-wide adoption, they were creating um, a resource for um, sort of like a, a foundational course in the marketing program. And it was, you know, going to be, I think, like five or six faculty authors. And it was just like a really big project. And we were like, you know, $5,000 is just not really going to cut it um, for the scale of what they're trying to do. And so there was a conversation about, can we sort of create a place in the program for um, a larger award specifically for a department-wide adoption that's gonna impact a ton of students, it's gonna have a ton of faculty authors included. Um, so we had our first one this past year, which has been a really interesting thing to see how that sort of has unfolded from a project management standpoint. Um, and they've been amazingly organized, like they've, really taken it and run, which has been really exciting. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing um, sort of where we go for the finished product. Um, and then this current cycle where we've just had a round of applications and we're sort of in the process of uh, reviewing and notifying and having those conversations. We had two applications for department projects this year. Um, so it's kind of cool to see it's, it's definitely a different type of application and a different type of um, project to support on our end. Um, but I think looking at the sort of impact and it, I think that's where it becomes even more important that like their project plan um, is really well developed and, and that, that they kind of have a good sense of what they're doing going into it because there's a lot more moving pieces. But um, I think asking those questions that Karen kind of walked us through at the beginning of like designing your call for proposals, like having that in the back of your mind of like, does this work for individual? Does this work for projects? Um, or do we need to uh, like have different considerations um, and make that explicit? I think is something to consider. I just want to add too about um, funding, you know, revised OER projects. I think that that is a really important aspect that all programs, particularly those that have been running for a couple of years, really need to think about. Um, OERs should not be static. Uh, courses change, faculty change and shift. And so we do need to think about how do we continuously help or support faculty who want to be able to revise their books. One thing that uh, we were thinking about at Portland State before I left was, um, do we want to do a separate call for proposals just for those faculty that we've already worked with? Do we want to reach out to them and say, hey, we have a small pot of money. We want to support you in your work to be able to revise your book. Let us know what you need and what that would look like. And you know we can we can um, help support you. The problem with that was that it was taking away from new projects. So the, it wasn't you know we had 
for example, $15,000 set aside for OERs. And we were only then able to add, you know, only able to do like 10 for new. So we did less projects in order to support the revisions, but we were thinking, and I still believe it's, it's really important because it is one of the concerns you sometimes hear from faculty about open educational resources, that they're old or they don't feel as though they're getting updated or revised at the same level of, as a publisher's textbook. So it's a good way to be able to circumvent that conversation. And Karen added, but the license means they can do that. And it's true. That's what the CC license is for. Um, are there any other, other questions? Okay, thank you so much, uh, Karen and Abby. We really appreciate you coming in and sharing your experiences today with us. It's been super helpful. Um, and thank you all for joining us as we continue to learn about open textbook publishing. Uh, we hope that as we continue to share available resources and recommendations, one of your key takeaways is the sense that you're not alone in fighting in finding out how to support open textbook authors. That is uh, that goes a long way too, <laughs> feeling that you're not alone. Um, just one quick announcement also, um, Help 101 is not meeting next week. Um, most of us, as we saw in the chat, are going to be at a library publishing forum. However, we will return to the regularly scheduled programming on Wednesday, May 22nd. So we're really looking forward to seeing you all then and have a great rest of your day.